We're in the book of Acts, getting really to the heart of the message that we've been looking at for the last four weeks, tonight being the fourth, or four weeks of this message, since we've had a lot of other things going on too. October 30th was, of course, Reformation Sunday, and we saw the DVD Mightier Than the Sword. Then last week was the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, and we saw the DVDs Hanele, and also a cry from Iran. And so the last time that we were in Acts was actually on October 23rd, looking at spiritual versus physical shipwrecks, part three. And tonight we have part four. We're in Acts chapter 27. We'll be looking once again at verses 27 through 37. Acts chapter 27, verses 37, excuse me, 27 through 37. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. But now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Oh, there are so many interesting things there. Those sailing with Paul. Being with the right person <laughs> at the right time whom God is going to bless. And I think if they had had to make a choice, if they were suddenly set with the option of choosing either to die or to keep their stuff, which is the loss of the ship, you know what? Every one of them would have chosen what the outcome of this storm was. They got their lives spared. Howbeit, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as I was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. When the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria throughout the midnight, the ship and deemed that we drew near to some country, and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little farther, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. They know what's happening. They're getting closer and closer to the rocks. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes from the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, this day is the fourteenth day that you've tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. Amazing. Paul was caring about their health in the middle of a storm like that. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. What do you think was in Paul's mind as he broke bread and gave thanks? Christ died for him so that he could live. And he reminded himself and all of those traveling with him of that night in which our Lord was betrayed. That was a stormy night also. That is spiritually. Then were they all of good cheer and they also took some meat and we were in all the ship 203 score and 16 souls, 276 people on that boat. Now what we've seen so far, we've tied predestination, election, and sovereignty of God to the predestined storms of life. We began by looking at the elect. We saw seven different ways that election is used in scripture. In each case, God making a choice. The term is used of Christ. The term is used of the holy angels in contrast to fallen angels. The term elect is used of Israel in the Old Testament. The term elect is used of Israel during the Great Tribulation. The term elect is used of God's children in every dispensation who call on him. The term elect is used of believers in the church age. The term elect is used to describe the local churches composed of true believers. Then we looked at how election falls into four different categories. The first category, the term election, is used in the New Testament of national Israel in contrast to the church. The second category, the term election, is used in the New Testament to distinguish believing Jews from non-believing Jews. 
The third category, the term election, was used of individual believers in the church age. The fourth category, we saw that there are three essential character qualities of election. The first element, election is not based on works. The second element, election is based on grace. The third element, election does not negate human responsibility. Then we began to study election in relation to predestination and made practical application of these two great doctrines to the storms that we face in our lives. In summary, we saw that God predestined 276 people to live through the storm and to be cast on a certain island to accomplish a specific evangelistic purpose ordained by God. We saw that the carnal mind hates predestination because predestination means that God predetermines our ultimate final destination and the destination of all morally accountable creatures, that is the angels as well as us, in advance. He determines those things solely with two things in mind. Number one, his glory. Number two, the ultimate best of his elect. Number three, we saw that predestination is an expression of the sovereign will of God, not the will of man. We broke that down into four different easy to understand parts. And we saw that Predestination is expressed in at least ten categories. The first three relate to salvation, to make us fully aware that salvation is a work of God, not of man. Category one, salvation, part one, being made children of God by adoption. We're full heirs, legal heirs, with Christ uh, because of the work of the Father and the Son, and we are recognized by the Father as sons and rightful heirs with Christ, joint heirs. Category two, salvation part two, being made children of God not only through adoption but through sanctification. Category three, salvation part three, being made children of God by faith. Category four, predestined to eternal inheritance. Category five, predestined to have and exercise specific spiritual gifts. Category six, predestined for a special offering to God. And we talked about the first fruits in the Old Testament and how Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. And in that category number six, we analyze the New Testament doctrine of first fruits. We saw that it's used to speak of the first budding of the new spiritual life in the believer that makes him or her yearn for the transformation of the body at the resurrection or at the rapture. Second, that was why Christ is called the first fruits of them that slept. Third, first fruits is used of every believer in a particular region that come to Christ and that bring joy to the evangelist or missionary or pastor since it means that a greater harvest is still coming. Fourth, we saw first fruits is also used of the Heavenly Father imparting the divine seed of faith in the believer who bursts out with new life. Fifth, we saw that it's also used of those who are morally pure in the book of Revelation, those who have burst forth with new life that has not been defiled. Category number six or seven, that, that finishes the category of first fruits and brings us to the seventh category of predestination, predestined to bear spiritual fruit. That's the visible proof of predestination and of election without bearing fruit you have no reason to believe that you are saved. Category eight below, there is no assurance that an individual is among the elect. Category eight, the eighth category of predestination is predestined to manifest specific good works to the glory of God. Works that meet the threefold test required by God. One, works done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, done in obedience to the word of God. Number three, done to the glory of God. In category nine, we saw predestination as part of the eternal counsels of God concerning the future work of Christ. Christ himself taught this. We saw that in John 5, 20 through 29, and Paul repeated it in his sermon in Acts 10, 42. Category 10, reprobation is also predestined. That's perhaps the most hated part of the doctrine of predestination. Some have phrased it more gently that God just passed over the non-elect, but the result is the same. There were certain men crept in unawares who before of old were ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. With those things in mind, we concluded that we can be confident that the storms in our lives are designed by God to cause us to reach the specific destination that he's planned for us. God didn't want them to go directly to Rome. He wanted them to be cast on an island because there were people there that needed to be saved including the Roman proconsul of the island, including that man's father, including other people on the ship, including those who were barbarians who thought that Paul had some kind of magical powers when a snake bit him and then he shook it off into the fire. There were people that had to be saved. God always sends someone if there are those who are among his elect, even if it's an impossible situation. And that was another humanly impossible situation, just like we saw this morning how God delights in the humanly impossible situations in breaking into history and doing something that nobody else could do. Paul looked at his multiple shipwrecks with confidence that these things were designed by God to make him into the man that God wanted him to be. And if you and I understand the storms of life and if we don't make spiritual shipwreck, which is our focus tonight, 
then we can see that God has a specific purpose in bringing us through those storms of life so that we might accomplish the purpose that he has determined in advance for us to accomplish to the glory of Jesus Christ and for our own good. Uh, there's an immense amount of suffering in Paul's ministry, and that's we talked about that this morning also, how most of us want to avoid suffering at all costs. And yet, embracing the doctrine of predestination gives you perfect confidence and peace as you sail boldly through the horrifying and sometimes extended storms of life. They're not all 30-minute squalls, as we talked about before. Not all the storms are merely physical inconvenience. Some involve direct confrontation with Satan. We're going to talk about that. And vicious apostates. We're going to talk about that tonight. Violent governments, intense suffering. Yet Paul gloried in all of these. He gloried in sailing into the very teeth of the worst storms because it gave him confidence that he was squarely in the center of God's will. Like the old saying, with all this opposition from the wicked one, I must be doing something right. And so the Apostle Paul gloried in that, and we read that entire passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 10 through 33, where he talks about all the horrible things that happened to him. He gives a big long list. He didn't just have one storm in his life. He had dozens of storms in his life. He had a storm every day of his life. He had storms that most of us would quit in the middle of the first storm and never get to all the rest of those storms. So that brings us tonight to spiritual versus physical shipwrecks part four. That brings us to the most dangerous kind of shipwreck. Spiritual shipwreck is a completely different matter that does not have the benefits of the predestined storms of life that we've just studied. Listen to what Paul says as he describes spiritual shipwreck in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. He's not dealing with a physical shipwreck here. He's talking about somebody's spiritual shipwreck. We'll talk about who those people are in just a second. Two of them are mentioned, and you know what? Neither one of them repented. In fact, one of them went on and gained a disciple, and another one was there at the very end of Paul's life testifying against him in court. Concerning faith have made shipwreck. Two things are tied together in that verse, faith and a good conscience. Peter tells us that there are those who are apostates who have seared their consciences. You know what happens when you sear something? Now, I grew up in Texas, and the way in which the cattlemen in Texas for the last several hundred years have marked their calf cattle is with a branding iron. They get the calf when it's young, they rope it, they run over to it, grab its legs, throw it flat on the ground, whap, while the rope is still around its neck, being held tight by the horse. And then while two cowboys are holding the legs, the front legs together and the back legs together, a third cowboy takes a branding iron that he's had in the fire and he sears the brand onto the rear hump of that little cow. And it gets up and it whines and cries and runs away. There are people who rustle cattle and you know what? When they get caught, well, at least they used to be hung. You a cattle thief, you can tell him if he's a cattle thief because somebody else's brand was on that cow. And people tried to fake it just like they try to counterfeit money today. They would take and have a different brand, but they would try to exactly fit over that other brand in such a way that it would turn it into a, a different brand. We talk about branding products, you know. Branding products today always have a special symbol, don't they? Every company has its own little doohickey that they put on all their products to show you that this belongs to that company. That's who produced it. But you know, in a physical brand, and slaves were branded in the scripture as well, it produces a scar that has no feeling. It's been seared. All the nerves in that area have been seared right out. And so if you poke it, the rest of the skin around it that's not seared might feel a little bit of pressure, but the pin, if you stick a pin into a scar tissue, you don't feel the pain that you would if you stuck it into normal tissue. Peter says that some have seared their conscience. Paul's dealing with that here because to deny certain things, you have to sear the conscience that God gave you. 
we're going to see the different areas in which that searing takes place. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. If you fail to respond to the storms that God puts into your life, if you respond in the flesh and not in the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to make shipwreck. Spiritual shipwreck falls into seven categories. At least, there's at least seven categories, probably more. We can't mine the scripture all the way through, but at least these are seven that I've seen. Number one, the first area of spiritual shipwreck where a man can make spiritual shipwreck or a woman is doctrinal failure on central key doctrines of the faith. Doctrinal failure on central key doctrines of the faith. The very next verse tells us about some men who made shipwreck that way. In verse 20, 1 Timothy chapter 1, looking at verse 19 and 20, holding faith in the good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander. And listen to what happens if you fail in this area. Whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, we'll probably not get to it tonight, but we want to talk because I have at least one more message on this. We want to talk in the future about what it means to be delivered to Satan. Paul did that. He actually did that at Corinth. We'll see that, the Lord willing, in next week. But notice something about verse 19. The word faith shows up twice in verse 19. The first time it shows up holding faith, it's without the definite article in Greek. Now, you know the difference between an indefinite article and a definite article. In English, we have an indefinite article, the little letter A, like a cow. That could be any cow. There are a bunch of cows out there, and you're talking about a cow. Well, the, the rancher might say, yeah, I got a bunch of cows, and you want a cow. Doesn't matter which cow, any old cow. But then you have what's called the definite article. That's the word the in English, T-H-E. I want the cow. Oh, the cow. You have a specific cow in mind. Yeah, the cow. The one over there, that cow. So we have definite article and indefinite article. In Greek, the way they express that is when you do not have any article at all, it's indefinite. When you have an article which is little one letter in Greek, ha, omicron, with a rough breathing mark over the top of it. It's talking about the cow. The first time that we have the word faith showing up in verse 19, it is without the article. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning, in Greek it's the faith, have made shipwreck. So what Hymenaeus and Alexander had done is they had put away something concerning the faith. And Paul says, because they did that, I have delivered them to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. What they denied concerning the faith, Paul categorizes as blasphemy. It's an important term. It doesn't mean just saying dirty words. You know, he's blaspheming again. Blasphemy is ascribing to a creature an attribute that belongs only to God. It's not just saying dirty words. Blasphemy in scripture is ascribing to a creature an attribute that belongs only to God. Like when Herod was giving an oration and all the people said, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. And Herod took it in pride. And God smote him with worms and they began to eat him and he dropped dead in front of them as the worms ate his body. Blasphemy is when you ascribe an attribute that belongs only to God to a creature, to another human being, to an angel. That's why Satan is so blasphemous. He's taking for himself in Isaiah the, the great I will, I will five times. He wants to be God. Well, that was not our thrust tonight. Let's move on. So we have the first faith without the definite article, the second with the definite article. We've studied in the past, when you see the definite article, the faith, 
That is the central body of truth once and for all delivered to the saints. It is the object of faith. Faith is when you trust something and the faith has a specific content that we trust. We have faith in the faith which centers around the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. In other words, what we call the gospel. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Notice another little phrase there in verse 19. It says, having put away concerning faith. That little phrase, having put away, literally means to thrust away with violence. They haven't just, like, put it away like you do your Christmas ornaments at the end of the season. You're very careful not to break them. And well, if you do those things. Anyway, you have these little ornaments that you stick in a box and you pack them away until next year and they take up space in your attic or wherever else and gather dust. No, this is having thrust away with violence. Here's some guys who thrust away with violence concerning the faith and as a result they've made shipwreck. The gospel is who Jesus is and what Jesus did. He's both God and man. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is always the heart of the attack that Satan makes when he's attacking the word of God. Because he wants to get away from the gospel, the good news by which men are saved. He can't be saved. His demons can't be saved. And he hates us because we can be saved. That's always the center of Satan's attack. It's here that we have to fight our first bloody battle. That's Satan's first line of attack. Jude explains that over in Jude, chapter 1, verse 3. There's only one chapter in Jude, but verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. He was really excited about writing to them about all the wonderful things that were in that big package called salvation. But he said... Instead, I had to write about something else. It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. See, that's where Satan makes his first attack. He makes his first attack against the faith. And Jude, writing to these new believers, says... I wanted to write to you about all the wonderful things that you have in your salvation. But instead I had to write to you about the attacks that are being made against the faith, the heart of the gospel. We know exactly the point of doctrinal attack because Hymenaeus is mentioned again by Paul in his very next letter in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2.14 Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit but to the subverting of the hearers, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We all know that verse, don't we? Do you know the context? Why did he have to study the word of God? Why did he have to make sure that he understood it thoroughly and exactly? Because this was where there was going to be an attack. But shun profane and vain babblings, verse 16, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, that's cancer, they understood cancer even back in Paul's day. They knew that it was there. Of whom is, and here is the same guy he mentioned in his first epistle, Hymenaeus and Philetus. Hymenaeus has picked up another disciple to his false doctrine. And we find out what it was in verse 18. Who, concerning the truth, have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. It was a tactic related to the resurrection. Now the resurrection is the heart of the gospel, but notice something. It was just a slight twist. Did you catch what he said there? Apparently they had not denied, this Hymenaeus and Philetus, had not denied the resurrection of Christ. Because they said the resurrection is past already. In other words, a resurrection already took place. But it's never going to happen again for anybody else. What happened was they were mixing pagan theology of Gnosticism with Christianity. Did you know that's still happening today? I hope you can come on Wednesday evenings when we begin this new series because there are a lot of Gnostic heresies that are perverting the church today. 
the same type of stuff that was going on with Hymenaeus and Philetus. Greek paganism taught that the physical body was bad and the goal was to be only spirit with some sort of an upward progression through different aeons, E-O-N-S. But you see, when God made man, God made man a tripartite being, body, soul, and spirit. And Christ has redeemed us entirely, not merely our spirits. And he is going to give us a resurrection body. That's the reason for the exhortation of the very next two verses here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 and, and uh, verse 23 also. The Christian is to put away iniquity that affects the body and not be involved in foolish speculations, which these guys were doing, about why it is permissible to continue in sin in this body, since according to Gnosticism it won't be raised anyway. So have fun, guys. Look at verse 19. Immediately after he talks about Hymenaeus and Philetus concerning the truth of Herod, saying the resurrection is past already, of overthrow the faith of some, he says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. He's just been talking about studying the scripture. So you're a workman that needs not to be ashamed by dividing the word of truth. The foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. Oh, we've talked about what a seal means in scripture. The Lord knoweth them that are his. In other words, God knows who is a fake and who is true. I'm sure Hymenaeus and Philetus claimed they were Christians. They didn't go out and say, hey, we're starting some kind of a new religion out here. All you guys who are Christians, quit Christianity and come over to us. They were pretending to be Christians. The Lord knoweth them that are his and. Now here's the practical application that answers the question of the heresy that Hymenaeus and Philetus had that the resurrection is past. Don't worry about what goes on in your body because after all, have fun with your body. Because, you you know, after you die, you're going to be moving through this spiritual progression and getting away from all the physical stuff. So have fun now. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's a word that means moral sin. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. That's what these guys try to get you into. There's all kinds of stupid arguments about how many angels can stand on the head of a pin kind of thing. Again, let me mention, Wednesday evening, we need to be here to start that series on pseudo-Christianity. It's springing up everywhere in the U.S. It does the same kind of mixing that we see here in the text. Down to verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not, be, must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Here's how you are to respond. Apt to teach. That means skilled at teaching. Patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. The leaders you can't ever win. Well, very rarely. But those who are caught up in this false doctrine, you know, the scripture talks about plucking them as brands from the burning that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. The first area where you make shipwreck is doctrinal deviation concerning the faith. That kind of doctrinal error is called the snare of the devil here in verse 26. It says that if you fall into that, the devil can take you captive at his will walks around and on a whim he says, well, he's into that doctrine over there. I'm going to grab him. I'm going to really pull him into something dirty. Taken captive by the devil at his will. You better make sure your doctrine is straight. Because if it isn't, you will be taken captive by the devil. Goes without questioning. You know that, that business of questioning the faith? That's questioning what God said. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Satan tempted Eve and said, half God said... So Hymenaeus is the first one that's mentioned there in 1 Timothy. Now he's not mentioned in that passage that we just saw in <clears throat> chapter 2 of 2 Timothy where Hymenaeus is connected with Philetus. He's got himself a new disciple. But he is mentioned in 2 Timothy in chapter 4, just two chapters later. Look over to 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Here's Alexander, who was mentioned back in chapter 1, along with Hymenaeus who was turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's over in Corinthians. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. You know, you're not saved by works, but you're rewarded according to works. If you track that through, there are like 30 passages in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that talk about our works and the reward that we get, either good or bad, based on our works. Read sometime the book of Revelation and look for that. You're going to find that over and over in the book of Revelation. You find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke. You find it in the book of Acts. You find it throughout the doctrinal epistles. You find it in several of the Old Testament prophets. You find it in the Psalms. People, God looks at what you do. Look at 2 Timothy 4.14 and following. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. In other words, the epistle to Timothy, the first epistle, got back to Timothy. Timothy warned Alexander, Hymenaeus and Alexander. Neither one of them repented. Hymenaeus picked up another disciple. And Alexander is still in 2 Timothy, withstanding the words of the Apostle Paul. Look at what else it says here. He hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me. Now, we don't know the specific context when this has taken place, but Paul apparently was like put on trial. And Alexander was one of the ones there who was accusing Paul of false doctrine. Paul had written to Timothy, say, Alexander's got false doctrine. Alexander was one of these bull-headed pig men who said, I'm going to fight back. I'm going to push back. It's Paul who's teaching the false doctrine. He greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, that's the answer about the words that Paul had said. Wow, look at this. No man stood with me, but all men forsook me. They were so scared of Alexander that they actually backed out on Paul Nobody stood with him. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Paul knew that these were people who had been sucked in by Alexander's false doctrines. But he said, I wasn't by myself. Verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known. Paul didn't back down either. Paul was God's bulldog. Remember we talked about that when he was stoned at Lystra? Went to Lystra and Derby, got you know, stoned. And then while the disciples were standing around, he got up and they walked back into the city. They didn't run away. Paul came right back into the city. He was like a bulldog. That the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. Tells you something else. Apparently, Alexander was one of those who didn't want the Gentiles to hear. We saw how the Jews at Jerusalem wanted to kill the Apostle Paul. We saw that this morning when we were talking about how God breaks through the impossible situations. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Apparently, this is a Gentile court. They could have fed him to lions. And Alexander is testifying against the Apostle Paul. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Alexander also apparently refused to repent after Paul's rebuke in 1 Timothy over a doctrinal issue. But he actually witnessed against Paul. And by the way, 2 Timothy is written shortly before Paul's execution. We don't know what else Alexander did after this point. 2 Timothy is the last epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote before he was executed by beheading in Rome. Just remember this, apostates and heretics can be very vicious. The second area of shipwreck, the first area was doctrinal deviation especially doctrinal deviation concerning the faith, the doctrine that makes up the heart of the gospel. The second area is moral failure. Second area for shipwreck is moral failure. Remember back in verse 19 that we just read? 
Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his and. Now here it is. Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Iniquity is moral sin. There are different words for sin. This is the one that deals with moral sin. That includes all of the many normal forms of sex outside of marriage, as well as all the perverted forms of sex that are forbidden under all circumstances. Paul goes on and expands the reasons in the next verse. So keep away from moral sins if you want to be a clean vessel used by God. Look what he says in verses 20 through 22. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself, that means clean himself up from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet, that is fitted for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. So it affects not only usefulness, it affects whether or not the works that you do will be considered good works by God. And then he explains it in verse 22. It's those things of your flesh that keep rising up and where you want to have these sexual relationships. Flee also youthful lusts. To follow righteousness. Here's the positive thing. The way you flee is by following that which is right, not sitting in neutral. You know, if your car is in neutral on a hill, you don't have to be in reverse to be going backwards. If your car is in neutral on a hill, it's going to go in reverse. You're pointed uphill, but you know what? You're still rolling backward if you're in neutral. You've got to have it in gear to go forward. Here is what you are to follow. Righteousness. Faith. Charity. That's agape love. Peace. And you know you're not alone. Look at the last phrase. With them that call on the Lord out of a... What kind of a heart? A pure heart. Moral failure has caused many a shipwreck in the lives, not only of Christian leaders, and you can name them by the score if you look at all the big, fancy, modern preachers, you know, who have gone into sin, all kinds of horrible things, immorality, it will make you go shipwreck. Number three, the third area of spiritual shipwreck is temptation to what we've called the other deadly sins. You know, that issue of moral impurity naturally brings us to the seven deadly sins which comprise the whole next area in which a Christian can make shipwreck. Now I have a question for you. Can you list the seven deadly sins? You know, I did an entire series on the seven deadly sins. In fact, I spent two weeks on each sin. The seven deadly sins. Did you know all seven of those seven deadly sins are given in Scripture as illustrations of how you can make shipwreck in your spiritual life? Let's see if we can name the seven deadly sins. Who can give me one? Well, we just listed lust, so that doesn't count. What else is seven, one of the seven deadly sins? Gluttony. That's another one of the seven deadly sins. Sloth. That's another of the seven deadly sins. He's looking back at his notes. <laughs> no, I know he's not. <laughs> okay. Sloth. Covetousness or greed. That's right. Wrath. That's right. This unmitigated anger. What else? There are two more. What's the sin of the devil? Pride. And there's one more. It's not the same thing as jealousy, envy. That's right, those are your seven deadly sins. Every one of those is given in scripture in illustrative ways in which someone has made spiritual shipwreck. I tell you, that's, that's, that should warn you as to why they have been historically called, not in scripture, but historically called the seven deadly sins. Because those things are the root of all the other kinds of sins that come up. And covetousness is the root of all of them. Lusting after things of earth that lead you to compromise in all of these different areas. 
That, of course, um, we're not going to go over all of those again. I, I hope you took notes when we did that. Let's just look at a few that cause shipwreck, and they're all listed in this one passage here that Paul describes. That we've just studied the perverted lust, and so Paul starts with perverted lust in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 22. We're in Romans 1, starting in verse 22. Follow along if you've got your Bibles, please. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Ah, when you turn away from the wisdom of God and turn to the wisdom of earth, or the wisdom of Satan, you become a fool. And here's what happens. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So we fall into moral impurity here who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And you know, all those pagan religions that worship the creation ended up in moral perversions in their temples with temple prostitutes. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God has a specific penalty which is shipwreck in specific areas. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men. You know, in the natural realm, God has given us a conscience, hasn't he? Remember what Hymenaeus and Philetus had done? There was a problem both with doctrinal error and conscience. Concerning the faith and concerning conscience. They had to sear their consciences to do these things. These people have to sear their consciences to do these. The men, likewise, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. Which includes things like AIDS today. You see, when you start on that slippery slope, it goes very fast downhill. We've seen that happen here in the United States. Fifty years ago, nobody could have imagined that so-called same-sex marriage would be suddenly legal. That when a new president is elected who stands against those things, there are riots and marches all across the United States. By the way, I hope you've noticed that a lot of those are run by different, quote, socialist organizations, which read that communists. Anyway, back to the text. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Okay, we don't want to think about God. So what is it going to do? It's going to put you back in the carnal mind. And the carnal mind goes into the seven deadly sins right away. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Remember, the way we're supposed to avoid it is to follow after righteousness. That's the first thing that is listed by Paul as he talks to Timothy. So the first thing that goes when you reject God's way, when you're headed for shipwreck, is instead of following after righteousness, you follow after unrighteousness. That's what it says. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Fornication. There are those illicit sexual relationships that cover all kinds of stuff. Wickedness, covetousness. Oh, there we have seven deadly sins. Greed. Maliciousness, full of envy. There's another one. Murder. Goes back to this hatred and debate and deceit and malignity and whispers and backbiters and haters of God. Proud, despiteful, proud. There we have another of them. Boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Boy, there's rebellion. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. Implacable, unmerciful. Now look at verse 32. Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are... Three words. Read them with me. Worthy of death. That's not what I said. That's what God says. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You have to sear your conscience to do that. Gets us right back to what Paul is talking about with Hymenaeus and Philetus. You know, that long list, and we're not going to go over every one of those sins right now, but that list gives a very clear warning that any sin that we stubbornly refuse to confess and from which we stubbornly refuse to repent is like a perverse jammed rudder on our boat 
that always ends our ship on the rocks of destruction. God says that the death penalty is the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. God says it right here. Who knowing the judgment of God, not only commit those things, they're worthy of death, and they have pleasure in the things that they're doing. You know, God says the death penalty is the wages of sin, and then he asks the question, why will you die? You know, God gave that specific question to Israel. Let me read you two verses out of Ezekiel chapter 18 and chapter 33. Here's God pleading with Israel. He says, cast away from you all your transgressions, not just this bad one here and this bad one over there, but everything else is okay. You won't die for those, but you'll die for the big ones, so get rid of the big ones. He says, cast away all your transgressions. This is Ezekiel 18.31. Whereby you have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? He says the same type of thing in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? God pleading with Israel to turn from their sin. And he pleads with us. What sin? You think, oh, I don't have any of those big sins. Okay, what sin are you Stubbornly resisting confessing? What sin are you stubbornly resisting repenting of? What are you continually trying to shove under the carpet so that nobody can see it, but you can see a bump in the carpet where it is? It's like a sin that's a dead piece of meat, and you stick it under the carpet, and nobody can see it, but you can sure smell it while it begins to rot. Why will ye die? O house of Israel. Let's go to number four. I can see we're not going to finish tonight, but number four, the fourth area of spiritual shipwreck. Fourth area of spiritual shipwreck. Temptation by temporal things and standards of the world. Temptation by temporal things and standards of the world. That's number four. John explains that over in 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Temptation by the spiritual things and the spiritual standards of the world. Did you know that the world around you has a different set of standards? I hope you've noticed. A different set of standards than God's standards uh, that might be your standards, but they're not God's standards. The things that the world is focused on. You know, I was having a discussion with one of the men here before the service tonight, and he was astounded at the kinds of things that people actually throw out in the trash. They have this standard of they got to get more and more and more and more junk and they pile it up and they pile it up and they fill up storage lockers and they fill up their houses and they fill and then finally they say, well, you know, I'm really not satisfied what I want is that over there but I don't have enough room for it so they throw a bunch of stuff out on the curb and then they get something else and put it in that storage locker. Wait a minute. Is there a problem with this? The world has a different standard than we have. And it goes back to one of the seven deadly sins, which is covetousness. Paul says, Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5, covetousness is idolatry. And the covetous man is an idolater. He's put something in the place of God. That's a serious, serious crime. Because the very first of the Ten Commandments, God's standard in the Old Testament, it's repeated in the New Testament. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And covetousness is idolatry. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, 
not he has half of the love of the Father and half of the love of the world. It says the love of the Father is not in him. It's black and white from God's perspective. There are no shades of gray. We're not walking in the twilight. We either walk in the light or we walk in the darkness. You cannot walk in between. Either you are walking in the light or you're walking in the darkness. Remember, there was no twilight zone between Israel and the Egyptians when the Shekinah glory came and stood between them in the middle. It was darkness to the one all the night. And it gave light to all the Israelites. But there was no shades of gray in between. That's a very serious area of spiritual shipwreck. Temptation by the temporal things and the standards of the world. Well, that also includes, and we're going to have to wait for this for next week, but it includes the way in which we deal with other believers when we insist on our rights rather than on our responsibilities. Did you know you can be perfectly right under the law and you can still make shipwreck, spiritual shipwreck? We'll have to pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you very much for your word and its power and its practical application. So many of us want to just learn theology, but we don't ever want to apply it. What does this mean in terms of the way I should be living my life for Jesus Christ? And we have the temporal standards of the world. We're willing to follow along with some rinky-dinky kind of false doctrine because, after all, it lets us get away with certain things. We're tempted to morally lust. Temptation has faced everybody that ever lived on the planet. Oh, Father, help us to understand that we also need to have your standards, first of which is righteousness. Because the first area of failure is unrighteousness. Father, we pray that you will keep us from the temptation of the temporal things. Keep us from the temptation of the temporal standards of the world, which do not keep eternity in view. Help us to focus on things that are above, not on things on the earth, for we are dead with Christ, and our life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Help us to set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Father, we pray that you will take the word of God as it has been proclaimed tonight. Remove anything that I have said falsely that you will cause us each to be convicted in our own hearts and lives of the sins that are in our lives so that we might live for Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. O oh God, keep us from shipwreck. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for tonight. Number 437.